I think about the goodness of Jesus and all that he has done for me, my soul cries out, hallelujah. Yes. Thank you, God, for saving me. Yes. Amen. Are you thankful that you're saved this morning? Thank you. Not only have you been saved, but you've been delivered. Yes. You've been set free out of bondage, out of trials, out of circumstances, out of situations. And our God is a good God this morning, yes, and His is. love and His mercy and His grace never fails, never fails, but it always exceeds and goes far beyond what we could ever think, imagine, or understand. That's God's grace. Aren't you thankful for that this morning? Give Him a big hand clap of praise like He deserves. This morning we're going to go to the book of 1 Samuel chapter number 17. We're going to read a few verses in chapter 17 and verses 32 through 40. And I want to share with you a story this morning that is a story that most all of us are familiar with. And it's the story of David. The story of David, we've probably all learned this story in Sunday school at some point in our lives. A very simple message but a very real message that we can put into context of our lives today. Beginning in verse number 32, And David said to Saul, Let no man's heart fail because of him. Thy servant will go and fight with this Philistine. And Saul said to David, Thou art not able to go up against this Philistine to fight with him. For thou art but a youth, and he a man of war from his youth. And David said unto Saul, Thy servant kept his father's sheep, and there came a lion and a bear, and, a, and took a lamb out of the flock. And I went out after him, and smote him, and delivered him out of his mouth. And when he arose against me, I caught him by his beard, and smote him, and slew him. Thy servant slew both the lion and the bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them, seeing he hath defiled the armies of the living God. Yes. And David said, Moreover, the Lord hath delivered me out of the paw of the lion, out of the paw of the bear, and he will deliver me out of this hand of this Philistine. Yes. And Saul said unto David, Go, and the Lord be with thee. And Saul armed David with his armor, and he put a helmet of brass upon his head, and he armed him with a coat of mail. And David girded up his sword against his armor, and he essayed to go, for he hath not proved it. And David said unto Saul, I cannot go with these, for I have not proved them. And David put them off him. And he took off, and he took his staff in his hand, and chose him five smooth stones out of the brook, and put them in a shepherd's bag, which he had even in a scrip, and in his sling was his hand, and he drew near to the Philistine. Yes. Let us bow our heads and pray this morning. Dear Lord, as we enter into your word, I ask God for you to capture our hearts, our lives, our spirits. Let us hear what you would say to us today. Let us receive your word and let us be empowered by the anointing of your spirit. Yes. And it's in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Can we all say amen? Amen. A few cliches that I want to share with you this morning that we are all familiar with. There's one that says, it doesn't matter how you start, it matters how you finish. It doesn't matter how you start, it matters how you finish. Another one says, it doesn't matter how many times you fall, it matters how many times you get up. It doesn't matter how many times you fall, it matters how many times you get up. Another one is, you don't have to be great to start, but you have to start in order to be great. You don't have to be great to start, but you have to start in order to ever become great. We all know the story this morning. There's the army of Israel and there's the army of the Philistines. One on one side and one on the other. And there's this champion by the name of Goliath and he's out there and he's chanting against the Philistines and this man was big, he was strong, he was mighty. 
Some believe that Goliath was probably nine feet tall and his armor weighed approximately 120 pounds. Almost as much as David weighed in his own weight was the weight of this mighty Goliath's armor. His spearhead alone weighed 15 pounds and the Israelites were afraid of the Philistine and they were afraid to go out and fight against him. And for 40 days, this Goliath would go out and he would chant and he would declare that somebody would come out and fight against him. But for 40 days, this went on and nobody would step out and nobody would stand up against this Philistine because they were in fear of this mighty giant. I don't know if any of us have gone to battle and fight a, to fight against a nine foot giant, but I would be assured that none of us in this room could match up against a man of this stature. Nine foot tall, many, many pounds, way, way above the height and weight of David. But Jesse, the father of David, <clears throat> told David, he said, David, I want you to go down there to where this Goliath or where the where the uh, Israelites are, and I want you to go down there and I want you to take them something to eat, take them some corn, take them some bread. And while David was there, this mighty Goliath came out and started chanting against them. And David said, "Where? why is everybody running? Why is everyone scared? And David said, is there not a cause? Is there not a reason? Is there something that we can do against this Philistine? And in verse 40 it said, and David drew near to the Philistine. Even after David had made all the promises, even after David had rehearsed his history, even after David had told everybody what he was going to do, there came a point that David had to first step out and he had to take a step toward the Philistine. Yes, he did. You know what that tells me this morning? If we want a miracle, if we want a, a healing, if we want something, a deliverance in our life today, we're going to have to step out and we're going to have to take a step toward the promise that God has already declared for our lives. Yes. When I started to title this message at one point, I thought about are there victories without fighting? And I, I thought there are no victories without fighting. And I, as I was thinking about the stories of the Bible and I looked at them, I thought, my goodness, there are no victories without fighting in life. There's none. Every victory that you have today first was fought by Jesus. And, and, and then you have to walk through circumstances and trials and turmoils in your life that you have to fight through every day of your life in order to find the victory and the deliverance that God has for you. Yes. It's true that there are no victories without fighting. This, is, this isn't logical that the key verse that activates our victory is the very fight that we are willing to put up. There is a process to obtaining victory. There is a process to obtaining deliverance. And the first step is that you've got to make up your mind that as today is for me and my house, we're going to serve God. Yes, yes. There might be hell that comes into my life. There might be famine that comes into my life. There might be dark situations that come into my life. There might be things that I didn't ask for that happens in my life. But today I've got to make a decision that I'm not going to lay down and quit. I'm not going to give up. But I'm going to fight for what God yes. has promised in my life. Yes. We live in a society today that people crave everything instantly. I've always liked to call it the microwave generation. We like to receive everything instant. We want instant success. We want a society, we live in a society of people who wants to give wants to receive something without first earning something. A society who wants to gain something without working for it. If you look at the extreme popularity of the casinos with a chance of dropping a quarter in the machine and leaving with a bag full of bills, or you look at the popularity of the lottery and people will play the lottery with a chance of winning a million dollars quickly, or you look at the popularity of the quick gets rich 
schemes. And, and it's funny what people will do when they think they're going to receive something. From the pyramid schemes to the chain letters, it is estimated that 9 in 10 Americans are owed cash that sits on unclaimed year after year. So it's quite likely that some of that money belongs to you. And so all you've got to do is pay $99 and we'll get that money back for you. And so they're getting rich off of the scheme that they're trying to create for you. We live in a world that wants instant gratification, wants yeah. instant everything. That's we want something without working for something. That's true. You see, I don't have any problems with getting a good deal, but our society has become one that wants something for nothing, and we want that in every part of our lives. We want good jobs without working for good jobs. Yes. We want good friends without putting good effort into being a good friend. We want a good we want good food without taking the time to cook good food. We want a big bank account stacked full of money without earning the money. And so if we're not careful, what will happen is that we'll bleed over into our spiritual lives and we expect for God to show up and do something for us and we don't want to do anything for Him. It's true. And if we're not careful, we'll expect that the victory is going to come whether we are willing to fight for the victory or not. I say church as an individual and as saints of God, we've got to stand up to today and we've got to declare the victory of Jesus yes. Christ in my life yes. and say I'm not afraid to take a stand. I'm not afraid to believe what God has for my life. Amen. I want victory in my church. I want victory in my life. And I've got to be willing to fight for it. I've got to fight for victory in my life. Are you willing to fight for the victory in your life this morning? Jesus said, I give unto you power to tread on ser serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. But he didn't say that he would do the treading for us. He said He gives us the power to tread those serpents. Yes, He does. If we're going to see victory in, we're in our lives, we're going to have to start picking them up and putting them down. We're going to have to go to work for what God has called us to do. It is up to us to take the step and go after the victory that He wants us to, to see in our lives. Yes. Let me say this morning, to get this message across, if you never take the first step, you're exactly where you are right now and you're exactly where you're going to stay. If you're ever going to get from point A to point B, you're going to have to take some steps and God is looking for somebody who is a stepper, who is a doer, who is not only a hearer of the Word, but that will go to work and put forth an effort and begin to work for what God has called for their lives. Absolutely. The world around us wants to reap without sowing, but that is not the law of the harvest. The scripture said, whatever you sow, that's what you're going to reap. We want to receive without giving. We want to partake without participating. But God is looking for somebody whose legs aren't broken, whose legs and hands have not been cut off. But God is looking for somebody who will step out and move toward the blessings that He has called you to get. What about the children of Israel? You say the children, children of Israel were constantly mumbling and constantly complaining about something. They were griping and doubting, but God still rode back the Red Sea for them. I think if we think of the story that way, we've gotten it wrong. Because that is not how the story went. God did not roll back the Red Sea because of the children of Israel. God did not roll back the Red Sea because of the children of Israel. God rolled back the Red Sea because there was one man by the name of Moses. There was one man down there that still believed what God said that he would do, that he would do. And there was a man that said, I know that God will make a way if we begin to move in the direction that he has told us to move. Yes. And when that one man Moses turned and made a step toward that sea, he stretched that rod over the sea and God opened the door to deliverance and he parted the sea and the sea split and the Israelites were able to walk through with deliverance. That was a miracle because of one man's obedience. 
to the word and yes, to the sir. voice of God. Yes, sir. Why was that a passage to deliverance opened up? It wasn't because of the griping. It wasn't because of the murmuring. It wasn't because of the doubt of the people. It was because of the faith of one man that took the first step and knew that salvation of the Lord was coming. Yes. But even past that, I want us to see the position of the children of Israel. Yes, it must have been mind-boggling when they saw the waters part. Yes, it must have been amazing that such a miracle had just taken place. God had made a way for them. But listen, the children of Israel would have stayed right where they were if they would have, and they would have been captured if they did not move along with Moses. I've got to get somebody to see this. It's not the parting of the water that saved them. It's not the dry ground that saved them. It's not the pillar of fire that saved them. It was their first steps that brought deliverance and saved them from their situation absolutely sure the parting and the water was awesome yes the dry ground and the pillar of fire was awesome but if they would have stood there like a bunch of statues pharaoh would have ground grabbed them and they would have been in slavery for the rest of their lives church god is looking for some steppers in a world full of statues yes Man. In 2 Samuel chapter 23 in verses 11 and 12, it says, And after this Shammah, the son of Agi the Hayrite, and the Philistines were gathered together into a troop, and there was a piece of ground full of lentils, and the people fled from the Philistines. But he stood in the midst of the ground and defended it and slew the Philistines. And the Lord wrought a great victory. In this book of 2 Samuel chapter 23, it tells us about David's mighty men. There was a group of highly tra trained soldiers who fought with David and aided him in his victories. Among these men were three others who served as David's personal bodyguards. These men and their exploits are described in these verses, but I want us to focus on these three special men, but this one man by the name of Shammah. The Bible tells us that the Philistines attacked the people of God. And when the attack came, the people of God had a decision that they had to make. They could stay and they could fight, or they could run and hide. They had a decision that they had to make. How many of you know that there's a time to fight when others are running away? Absolutely. It was a time of great conflict, and the Bible is clear when it tells us that the Philistines were attacking the people of God. It was a time of great conflict for the children of Israel, but notice what the Bible reveals about this time. Why the enemy came. The enemy came against Israel for two reasons. Number one, to inflict casualties, and number two, to destroy the crops. The Philistines knew if they could bind their enemies and bring them to a place of hunger, they would defeat them and they would enslave them. And so those soldiers would march through the fields, trampling down the crops and slaughtering all that stood in their way. You see, the same is true this morning concerning the devil. He comes for two reasons. To inflict casualties and to destroy the crop. He attacks us so that he might weaken us so that we'll, it will be easier to enslave and crample down under his will. But I want to let the devil in on a secret today. The devil and the world don't mind us having church here at all. 
The devil doesn't mind us singing. He doesn't mind us preaching. He doesn't mind anything we do. But when we decide that we're going to take a step against him and fight against him, that's when trouble will try to break loose in your life. True. The devil will attack you when you start to pray. He will attack you when you reach out to begin to witness for the glory of God. He will attack you when you decide that you are not satisfied to be like other churches. When we decide we're going to take a step for the Lord, that's when hell will break loose. You're right. As long as we're doing nothing, we're no threat against the devil. No. But just let a few people in the house of God begin to sing and praise and let the glory fall and let the spirit and the anointing begin to fall. The enemy will invade the pea patch and he will try to stomp out the crop. You're right. At the end of verse 11, we read, and the people fled from the Philistines. What the enemy found, the Bible tells us that when the enemy came, all the people fled before them. What the enemy found was no opposition. They would march into the fields and the people would flee in terror. Isn't that exactly what happens in our lives? So oftentimes, the enemy comes in like a flood and we just lay down and give in to his defeat. It's true. Things will be going along just fine and the devil will stir up some trouble, stir up a ruckus, and we're afraid to take a stand. We're afraid to fight. Don't have the courage to stand up and take the first step against the attack of the enemy and look him in the eye and say, by the grace of God, you will not destroy this pea patch. Yes. As I look back over the course of my life and things that have happened in my life and I look at the enemy that he's tried to, to destroy me and he, he's tried to kill me and he, he's tried to defeat me and he's tried to come against me, I have still raised up a standard against the enemy and said that you will not have me, you will not destroy me, I forsake you in the name of Jesus. Yeah. Having gone through a divorce where the devil tried to kill me, having gone through cancer where a cancer attacked my body and I was in stage four cancer situation, given 20% chance of survival in five years and now it's been six. The enemy tried to destroy me in those ways. And then a couple of years ago, I was with our local church down in Louisville and in, 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 in Portland area. We went down into Portland and we were driving down the street and we saw some men that were in ski masks. We went to go pull into that street and as we did, we realized that something was happening. My daughter Haley was with me. And she said, Daddy, get out of here. Something's going on. And so I pulled out of that street and went back. And when I did, they started unloading on us. Nine millimeters, about 12 shots through the side of my Suburban, through the back windows, completely shot out. The devil tried to destroy me then. The devil will try to destroy you in your life when you're trying to do something for the kingdom of God. But if you raise up a standard against it, he cannot defeat you. Come on, I said he cannot defeat you. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. There is no weapon formed against me that can prosper in the name of Jesus. There is no weapon that can be formed against you today that can prosper in your life. Come on, give him praise in this house. Give him praise in this house. Let's remain standing today. The armies of Jehoshaphat said, we'll take the first step, we'll sing and we'll praise God. The three Hebrew boys said, we'll take the first step, we'll stand instead of bowing down. Daniel said, I'll take the first step, I'll keep on praying. The lady with the issue of blood said, I'll take the first step, I will press in. 
The demon possessed man from Gadara said, I'll take the first step. I will run to Jesus. The demon possessed man said, I'll take the first step. I'll go to church. David said, I'll take the first step and I'll go fight against this Philistine. Somebody in this building today, you need to step out and you need to take the first step for what God is calling you to do. You need deliverance in your body. You need deliverance in your situation. There is a God here today that will bring healing to your situation. Let's sing and praise the Lord today. Well, he's a long time gone. Yes, he is. Oh, he's an old time God. Yes, he is. Be there right on time. He's an old time God. Yes, he is. Well, you can ask the children of Israel. They were trapped at the Red Sea. They were trapped by that mean old Pharaoh and his mighty army. They had water all around them. They had Pharaoh in their tracks. Well, but out of nowhere, my God stepped in and cleared a highway just like that. He's an old time God. Yes, he is. He's an old time God. Yes, he is. Well, he may not come when you want him, but he'll be there right on time. He's an old time God. Yes, he is. You're here this morning, the altar is open for you. That's the children of Israel. Come on, it's they were for trapped you now. at the Red Sea. They were trapped by that mean old Pharaoh and his mighty army. They had water all around them. They had Pharaoh in their tracks. Oh, but out of nowhere, my God stepped in and cut a highway just like that. He's an old time God. Yes, he is. Oh, he's an old time God. Yeah, there are others here this morning. You need prayer. Prayer for salvation. They will not healing. come when you want him, oh, but he'll be there right on time. He's an old time God. Yes, he is. Jesus now. Well, you can ask the 5,000. Hungry souls got fed Some of you ladies come on here, the banks that of that river with two fish and five here. loaves of bread. Oh yes! What a miracle he performed on that multitude. You need a touch of God in your life. You know time. what he did way back then. He'll do the same for me and you. He's an old time God. Yes, yes he is. Yes, he is. Are there others this morning needing prayer? Well, he may not come when you want him, but he'll be there right on time. He's an old time God. Yes, he is. He's an old time God. Yes, he is. He needs a touch of God. Oh, oh, he's an old time God. Yes, he is. Come on, guys, you come in here and pray. Well, he may not come Please. when you want him, oh, but he'll, but he'll be there right on time. He's an on time God. Yes, he is. Well, you can ask the 5,000 hungry souls got fed on the banks of that river. With two fish and five loaves of bread. Oh, yes. You know what a miracle he performed on that multitude. And oh, you yes. know what 
what he did way back then. He'll do the same for me and you, cause he's in all time. Pray with him. Let's pray here with yes, him. Yes, he is. Come on, guys, move in here. Pray. Oh, he's in all time, God. Yes, yes he is. Well, you may not come when you want him, but others in need prayer. Be there right on time. He's an all-time God. Yes, He is. Well, you can ask the children of Israel. They were trapped at the Red Sea. Oh, yes, they were. They were trapped by that mean old Pharaoh and his mighty army. They had water all around them. They had Pharaoh in their tracks. Oh, but out of nowhere, by God stepped in. He cut a highway just like that. Well, he's in a long time, God. Yes, he is. Yes. 